Year one on Mars. From the time the first human being set foot on an alien planet until the day they celebrate their first Martian anniversary. What will the planet Mars have in store for them? Equal parts of danger and adventure, some of the greatest technologies in human history put to the ultimate test, and the most stunning example yet of humankind's ability to survive and conquer any obstacle. For even one day on Mars to be successful, a million things have to go right, and the margin for error is paper thin. But this isn't science fiction right now. This is the plan. This is the culmination of everything that so many people have dedicated their lives to. Let's talk about the first year of the first human colony on the planet Mars. This is the space race. So I think it's safe to say that the human transit between Earth and Mars is going to happen in a SpaceX starship. That's not like an Elon Musk fanboy thing, that's just an acknowledgement that there is literally no other practical idea that is anywhere close to being developed right now. Unless we want to wait another 20 years for the next best idea to come along, it's going to be Starship or bust. The plan from SpaceX right now is to fly 10 to 20 people on each Starship. And then there will be about 1100 meters squared of pressurized crew space on board. NASA actually did a study on the psychological effects of minimum habitation volume for long duration crew missions, and they figured that for a 180 day voyage, there will need to be at least 22 cubic meters of space per person to avoid everyone going insane along the way. So for a 20 person Starship flight, they should be more than comfortable at something like 55 cubic meters of space per person. As for when this flight takes place, it depends on who you ask. I think Elon Musk has said as early as 2026 for crewed missions to Mars. That seems ambitious to say the least. We could probably assume 2030 as a good middle ground between optimism and realism. The idea being that there has already been at least one round, probably two rounds of autonomous cargo ships that have flown to Mars and landed successfully. Maybe the first ever starship on Mars happens in 2026, and the first large scale supply drop comes in 2028. This is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, we need to double, triple, and quadruple check that the starship can actually land on Mars with a high degree of confidence while fully loaded with cargo. Like, you know how the first suborbital test ship landed successfully just one time without exploding and SpaceX decided they were good to go on the next step? That's not going to cut it for crewed missions to Mars. We are going to need to see things perform repeated and flawless landings before we load a starship full of our best and brightest interstellar heroes. So assuming our first crew reaches the surface of Mars without exploding, then they should actually be arriving at a pretty well-stocked Mars base. We've gone over this whole idea in the past, but pretty much the only idea that makes much sense would be that an entire crew of autonomous robots have already been hard at work for the past two years, building the foundations of the Mars base in expectation of human arrival. That's probably going to look like 3D printed shelters made from a new kind of Martian concrete type material. In situ resources like basalt and regolith mixed with a biological stabilizer seems to be the best bet. So whether or not we're using some kind of an artificial cave system or egg shaped towers, we can expect them to be waiting for us. The ship that we arrive on can still provide some shelter, but that's very limited in its usefulness. Like we said earlier, the longer the duration of the mission, the more personal space people will require in order to maintain their sanity. We have to grow our living space beyond the ship. We know that rovers on Mars are pretty well handled already, we've got that figured out. And we're even now figuring out how to fly drones on Mars. But I love to imagine a humanoid robot being the first real settler on Mars. The Tesla bot seems like a pretty solid candidate for the job. During Tesla's January earnings call, Elon Musk spoke about how he was making Tesla's humanoid robot project a top production priority at the company. He said that in the long run, there would be more business opportunities from selling bots than from selling cars. 
Elon also said that the first uses for the Tesla bot would be doing work at the company moving stuff around the factory floor. And since Elon also owns SpaceX, it only makes sense that the Tesla bot would find a position at that company as well. And I can't imagine that Elon wouldn't stash a few of them on a Starship mission to Mars. If he really wanted to, he could send an army of these things. If Starship has a max weight capacity of 100 tons and the Tesla bot weighs 125, then in theory, they could bring about 1,700 robots in one Starship. I'm sure we don't need that many, but I'm pretty damn sure there will be a party of Tesla bots to welcome the first human settlers on Mars. Having said that though, the party is going to be over real quick because this is a long haul mission. Just bailing out and flying home is not an option. It's literally impossible to do. We're looking at a two year stay and that means we need to get hunkered down and figure out a way to live with this alien environment. As it stands with our current technology, it takes about 22 minutes for a signal to reach from Mars to the Earth or vice versa. So that would mean no opportunity for a live chat as the landing procedure is taking place. The pace of communication would actually be infuriatingly slow when you think about it. Is there a solution? Maybe. Maybe one of the things that happens before people even arrive on Earth is one of the other tricks that SpaceX has up their sleeves the Starlink communication satellite. We know that so far the Starlink network around the Earth has been very successful, even in the first stage of deployment. Pretty soon, we'll be seeing what happens when SpaceX activates an optical laser link between satellites, which should greatly increase speed and connectivity by eliminating ground stations and sending internet signals at the speed of light through the vacuum of space and we still haven't even gotten to the Starlink V2 satellite. Both Elon Musk and SpaceX president Gwyn Shotwell have said that Starlink will eventually be able to transmit between planets. It won't be easy though. Elon has acknowledged that there will need to be some kind of a large scale transceiver and receiver system that goes above and beyond the standard satellite network. And even if they can ramp up the power to send a signal that far, it only will work with a line of sight. There are times during the orbital path of the Earth and Mars when the sun is in between the two planets, and that's obviously going to interfere with the space laser. Maybe we can figure out some relay points in between, but that's going to require some very smart people to figure out. We can say with pretty fair certainty that there will be opportunities to increase the speed of communication at least some of the time. Let's talk about how our first human settlers on Mars are going to keep up with the necessities of life, food, water, and oxygen. As for food, yes, there is obviously going to be plenty of space to bring dehydrated, freeze-dried food along on the journey. The same kind of stuff that astronauts on the International Space Station eat on a daily basis. But NASA does not think this will be a complete solution for a long duration mission, such as an interplanetary journey. According to NASA, the vitamins in prepackaged form break down over time, which presents a problem for astronaut health. And this is a lot of the reason why they have been experimenting with growing plants on the ISS. They called the project Veggie, and it's all about learning how plants grow in a microgravity environment. Now, Mars won't be microgravity, but it does have significantly reduced gravity compared to the Earth. So it's fair to say that lessons learned on the ISS will transfer over. So far, they've been able to grow three types of lettuce, Chinese cabbage, Mizuna mustard, red Russian kale, and zinnia flowers on the station. So good news for upping the vitamin content of an astronaut diet. But obviously just eating leaves isn't going to supply the total calories needed to do daily work and probably not enough protein to maintain muscle mass, which is going to be a serious challenge even in the best case scenario due to the low gravity. Now water is a really tricky one because it is very heavy and as humans, we need a lot of it to survive. Plus, if we are going to grow space plants, they'll also need water. We can bring a lot with us, but not an unlimited supply. According to my feeble math skills, if a starship can bring 100 metric tons of weight and the average person needs about five pounds of water a day, then a starship full of water can support 20 people for about 2200 days, which would be more than enough. 
Not that you would want to have all of that water in one place. Maybe you split it up between different ships or something. But even if we couldn't bring enough, there is water on Mars that we can exploit. Maybe. So we know, or at least we're pretty sure, that there is water ice on Mars. We also know that liquid water may have existed on Mars previously, but it doesn't right now, because according to physics, it would not be possible for water to exist in liquid state. The atmospheric pressure is too low and would result in the ice transitioning straight to vapor form if it were melted. If we were to bring that Martian ice into our pressurized living area, then yes, we could melt it into liquid. But would that be safe to drink? Almost certainly not. The water could be full of harmful impurities like heavy metals or salts, so it needs to be cleaned and desalinated before it can be used. In theory, we know how to do this from doing similar processing to water on Earth. But a challenge on Mars is that we don't currently know what contaminants to expect. Clean air is going to be another tricky one. But luckily, this is another area where NASA is already well into the research and development phase. They already have a device on Mars called MOXIE, which is the Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment. It converts the mostly carbon dioxide atmosphere of Mars into breathable Earth-like air. And this device is actually on Mars right now doing its thing. The MOXIE was sent along with the Perseverance rover. Yes, I got the name of the rover correct in today's video. Apologies to everyone who came here from the last one. So, MOXIE is about the size of a toaster in this first iteration. And so far, oxygen production has been modest, about 5 grams in the first test, equivalent to about 10 minutes worth of breathable oxygen for an astronaut. MOXIE is designed to generate up to 10 grams of oxygen per hour. So, if this were your only source of oxygen on Mars, you'd be doomed. But this is just the first attempt, and it's just a tiny little guy. So in theory, if this same tech could scale up about 100 times and gain some efficiency, then we might have a very feasible system to sustain breathable air in our Mars base. So not to be too anticlimactic or anything, but that's going to be the real accomplishment of the first year on Mars, just surviving. Establishing the means for human life on an alien world is not going to happen overnight. Robots can build the foundations and the framework for us, but it's going to take human minds to make it all work. The transition from living off of supplies and rations that we bring from Earth over to sustaining ourselves from in situ resources that we extract and process ourselves is going to be incredible. Learning to live off the land, you could say. It's going to be vital for an actual long-term large-scale settlement of Mars for us to have sustainable, renewable resources there just as we do here. Obviously, there's going to be a lot to learn along the way. What are you thinking, though? Do we land people on Mars in 2030? And if we do, then what does life on the red planet look like after a year or two years? Drop your theories below. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.